So turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1 as we finish up the very first chapter. We only have 65 left. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 1. We'll pick up bigger chunks as we go along. Let me read to you our text this morning. Chapter 1, verses 21 through 31. Chapter 1 of Isaiah, verses 21 through 31. Here, the infallible authoritative word of God. How the faithful city has become a whore. She was full of justice, but and righteousness lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross. Your wine, best wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless, and the widow's cause does not come to them. Therefore, the Lord declares... The Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. Ah, I will get relief from my enemies and avenge myself on my foes. I will turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross with lie and remove all your alloy. And I will restore your judges as at first and the counselors as at the beginning afterward. You shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed by justice and those in her who repent by righteousness. But rebels and sinners shall be broken together and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. For they shall be ashamed of the oaks and that you desired and you shall blush for the gardens that you have chosen. For you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers and like a garden without water, and the strong shall become tender, and his work a spark, and both of them shall burn together with none to quench them. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning. I mentioned last week that you're going to need a Bible. If you don't have one, I'm, I hope you do, but if you don't, that's okay. There are Bibles in the back. Uh, if you don't have one, um, grab one, keep it. If you don't have one, it's yours. Um, but we're going to be going through larger sections of Scripture pretty soon. And you got to have the Word of God in front of you to follow along. But as of now, um, we are simply looking at ten verses. We started this series uh, last week, a series we're calling The Gospel According to Isaiah. There's so much in the book about the Messiah, Jesus Christ the King in the Gospel, we decided to call it The Gospel According to Isaiah. In fact, I mentioned last week, it's been rightly called the Romans of the Old Testament. If you know anything about the New Testament epistle, Romans, we know it's the most systematic and methodical and clear presentation of the gospel in all the New Testament. And here we see Isaiah, who's one of, the, one of five major prophets, one of five major Old Testament prophets. And we learn from chapter 1, verse 1, that his ministry continued through four kings, four kings of Judah. There was Uzziah and Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah. So from about 739, 740 uh, B.C. through 686, 50-something years, is this prophecy. If you remember from last week, very important, the kingdoms of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, were split in two after King Solomon. Twelve tribes together in the north had their own king. Their city was Samaria. Two tribes to the south became Judah. The tw ten tribes of the north kept the name Israel. The two tribes of the south, Judah, uh, used the name Judah. You see in Scripture also their city, capital city, was Jerusalem. And you got to have these two things in your mind, these historical events, if you are to understand much of the Old Testament, particularly the prophets. We also need to know that the kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes of the north, were defeated by Assyria conquered by Assyria in 722 B.C. They came in 724 uh, to attack Israel, the ten tribes to the north, and then really decimated the city of Samaria in 722, taken into captivity. And then in 586 B.C., Judah, by now the people that were in charge, <laughs> the, the world power was Babylon, the king Nebuchadnezzar. And they were decimated in 586 B.C. They were, they, were, they, they were told over and over again by the prophets to repent of their sins. They were warned about this coming rebellion, uh, this coming military attack against their, their own nations, their own cities, and that God would discipline them. 
because of their sin and failure to repent. So you got to know what, what prophet, who's talking to who, what period of redemptive history uh, he's talking to. All that stuff is very important. We talked about it last week. I won't get into it again this, this week. But if you know, Isaiah is speaking to Judah, the southern kingdom, 15, 16, 17 years before the northern kingdom would be decimated. Right on the heels. Watching his own brothers of the northern kingdom as his ministry goes on, be decimated. God had a lot to say to Judah through Isaiah. But God also, let's not mistake, you'll see it in a few months or in a few weeks, God had a lot to say to other kingdoms, not just Judah. Isaiah had a lot to say, God had a lot to say through Isaiah to many other kingdoms, and we'll see that because God is the king and ruler and sovereign of all the world, of all the kingdoms, including America. This book will, will show us that. But as we get into chapter 1, we're really looking at the prelude, the, be, the beginning of the book. Actually, chapter 1, I think, can be said, I think has been said, really covers all the major themes of the entire other 65 chapters. Just chapter 1, the prelude, the beginning. Last week, the prophet began his communicating of God's word to God's people by calling, verse 1, verse 2, the heavens and earth, not just as listeners, but as witnesses of what is going on in Judah. The courtroom setting was followed by his indictment. What is the Lord going to do about their sin? What is the Lord going to do about this pervasive, sinful, rebellion people? Remember, we said last week, it's covenant language. In fact, if you have your Bibles open in chapter 2, of uh, chapter 1, verse 2, the word Lord there, capital letters, is the word, translation of the word Yahweh, the, the covenant name of God. You see, God had delivered, God had redeemed, God had rescued Israel out of slavery in Egypt years before and made a covenant with them and gave them the Mosaic covenant, gave them obligations, promising them uh, um, uh, blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. In fact, he called four times heaven and earth to be witnesses of that covenant that he made. And now God is calling Judah into account. Let's not forget, I'm going to mention this over and over again, let's not forget right now anyway He's talking about the covenant people of God. He's talking to the covenant people of God. Not strangers. Not other nations. He's calling into account their sin. The church of the Old Testament. And verses 2 and 3, it reads like a broken-hearted father who has rebellious kids who should know better. Verses 4 through 9 of chapter 1, their indictment of their sin. Chapters 10 through 15, excuse me, verses 10 through 15, God speaks of their insincere and corrupt worship. And then last week we ended with verses 16 through 20 with the invitation. The way back through repentance and cleansing. Wash, verse 16, yourself. Verse 18, come, let us reason together. Your sins are like scarlet, red, they shall be white as snow. Like red crimson, they shall be like wool. But now as we pick up in verse 21, it's almost as if God's like, yeah, they're not going to listen. <laughs> oh, how many times has he said that to me? Yeah, he's not going to listen. And, and, and the rest of this chapter seems that, well, verses 1 through 20 falls on deaf ears and deaf and hard hearts. And God now is continually calling his, his covenant people back from their sin. But again, like last week, he gives them great hope. We'll begin with verses 21 and looking at the present lamentation. The process of purification and the promise of redemption. That is our outline for this morning. The present lamentation, the process of purification, and the promise of redemption. Verse 21. How the, un how the faithful city has become a whore. She who was once full of justice, righteousness, lodged in her, but now murderers. You see the, the exclamatory how opening up this verse in the Hebrew uh, is, is an expression of lamentation. In fact, the book, uh, an expression of lamenting. In fact, the book of lamentation opens up with that same Hebrew word. And the prophet is portraying Jerusalem and, and he's crying out over Jerusalem as if God is just lamenting over Jerusalem. 
Not only portraying Jerusalem as, as dead in their sin, but as a prostitute, as a whore. There were times, it says in chapter, uh, in verse 21, there were times of, uh, there, were, there were faithful leaders, faithful priests, faithful kings, a faithful city, a city of justice and righteousness. They were full of justice. They had righteousness in her, but now there's a lament, an expression of objection and amazement. How could it be? How is it possible that this city who had righteousness dwell in her? Justice has now become a harlot, the city of harlotry. That means if you're unfamiliar with the term, the people seen here in, in, in this, the personification of Jerusalem or Zion, we'll see, had formerly been devoted to the Lord, had had a city where there was faithfulness that dwelled, but now they became unfaithful by pursuing other gods. The Old Testament we read this morning, Josh picked the, uh, well, whoever, we read the verses about Hosea, Hosea's book about a promiscuous wife. Hosea 2.2, 2, plead with your mother, plead for she is my wife and I am not her husband that she may put away her whoring from her face and her adultery between her breasts. They turn their back, the God's people turn their back on their covenant God and God considers that and compares that to a breaking of a marriage covenant. Isaiah, excuse me, Exodus chapter 34.14 you shall worship no other gods, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Not the creepy jealousy, but I created you, jealousy. I know what's best for you, jealousy. Is a jealous God, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. And when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of this sacrifice, you're joining them in their false worship, and you take your daughters and your children, your sons, and they whore after other gods and make your sons whore after other gods as well. Now, to some degree, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, you'd be thinking, that's in the Bible? Well, think about it for a moment. Followers of Christ are what? The bride of Christ. Awaiting a, a final wedding of the Lamb and her bride, the church. 2 Corinthians 11, Revelation 19. His love for his church is a passionate marital love, claiming us uh, for himself alone. That's what marriages are. We long for that day when Jesus will present us, his bride, the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, that she might be holy and without blameless. Blemish, excuse me, Ephesians 5. And when God's people then and now when God's people then and now go after other gods, have other allegiances, other idols, we commit spiritual whoredom, adultery. In fact, James 4.4 4 says, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The world's systems... The world's ways, running after false idols, you adulterous people. I mean, let that sink in for a minute. Let that lament sink in. A sorrow from heaven. Scripture earlier in chapter 1, we see this father broken over his wayward people, and now a husband lamenting over his unfaithful spouse. And when we dismiss the Lord and give not him the honor and glory to deserving his, 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 his honor, that deserving what he deserves, I should say, our relationships deteriorate and our society actually disintegrates. Look what it says. We become murderers. Now, I don't know if it was literal. It probably was. But we know from Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on a Mount, that our sinful anger... And hatred that leads to bitterness is in itself the very nature of murder. It's committing murder in the heart, Jesus says. 1 John 3, 15, everyone who hates his brother. Talk about the family of God. Is a murderer. 
I mean, what a contrast. You have this lodging. A lodging the word lodging is, is like, like checking in at a hotel. It's spending time. You have this lodging, a place of righteousness has now become the place or the lodging of murderers. <laughs> at one point in time, righteousness, doing right, was found and lodged in Jerusalem. It was safe. It was secure. It was a place to dwell. But now murderers do. And Isaiah moves from adultery to adulteration. An act of making something that was pure less pure, less in quality by adding substance. Verse 22, your silver has become dross, your best wine mixed with water. Dross, that substance, the garbage, the, dis, the stuff that's disregarded during the refining of metals. Waste materials separate from metals during the process. We'll look at this in a minute, but you can see it here. During the process of what's called smelting, heating the metals, separating that which is good and that which is worthless. Precious silver has deteriorated in your community to the point of being disregarded, worthless. And how does good wine turn into cheap wine? Water it down. Water it down. By diluting it with water, both the products, these products both suffer adulteration, a, a deterioration of quality. There's impurities back into what was pure, what was good, what was right. And God's saying that's what happened with Jerusalem. That once was a city of righteousness and justice has been deteriorated, diluted. And it happens to us sometimes when we fail to do something, respond to the call of God about our sin. Again, once wine touched by water... No particle within that bottle of wine remains undiluted. No, part of it is untainted, right? Precious silver becomes disregarded. Sin and rebellion when left unconfessed, unchecked, permeates all of life. That's what he's saying. Sometimes we think we can control our sin, separate it, keep it in and check from affecting us and separating it from our lives, holding on to it. And sometimes we think it's like taming a lion. We think we can tame or control a lion and make it our pet. And for a season, it's under control. It will lie down. It will respond to, to petting and to talking. But then time goes on and it awakens and it devours us. Unconfessed sin... And rebellion will dilute and permeate all of life. Trying to tame it won't help. And eventually, as time moves on, as you see in this text, your whole life will be influenced by sin, but not just you, your community and your leaders. Verse 23. God says, your princes, princes and rebels, companions of thieves, everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not bring justice to the fatherless, and widow causes does not come to them. The spiritual community has gone bad because unfaithfulness to God destroys community. When people forsake God, the community suffers, and leaders are corrupt. Princes are corrupt. And then, as they say, so goes the people. When the gospel is nor ignored, when, when God is forsaken and despised, we see that in verse 4 as well, there will be bribes. And, and there will be the marginalization of, of helpless people and hopeless people in our community. This kind of action, kind of running after things, stuff violates the justice of God. Ray Ortland says this, the reason why helpless people get stepped on in this world is that powerful people lose their sense of God, end quote. That's a great quote. When life becomes about us, when life becomes about our wealth, when life becomes about our dreams, our success, and the only people that matter are those who actually made something of themselves, we lose the awe of a personal God who created all of creation. Who cares about all of his creation, including those children in the womb. And we become people who could care less about others. And oppression is justified because he who has the most toys, as we know, wins, right? Desiring prosperity but having no justice. Desiring prosperity without much integrity. 
bribes then, injustices, orphans and widows are dishonored. And then the problem with that is, and I, I think we could say we see it in our own culture, uh, it comes from a, a, a deficient view of who God is and an is insufficient view of the Imago Dei created in the image and likeness of God. Every single person is created in the image of likeness of God and, and therefore worthy of value. That's why if you read 1 Timothy 3 and other places, elders of the church, those lead the church, must not be greedy or do so for the mighty dollar or pursue dishonest gain. <laughs> Multiple jets. Because <laughs> leaders are, are giving the... the Leadership gives people, those in leadership, the potential to abuse their power and to exploit people rather than serving their needs. And we're seeing that roll out in, in famous Christians today. We're not to love money and use people. I've said this before. We're not to love money and use people. Rather, we ought to use money to love people. The present lamentation. Look at this process of purification. Verse 24. Therefore, the Lord declares, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. Ah, I will get relief from my enemies and avenge myself on my foes. I will turn my hand against you and will smelt the way you draw us. Picking up from an early image. As with lie and remove your alloy. I will restore your judges as at first. Consider uh, and your counselors at, as the beginning. Afterwards, you shall be called what? The city of righteousness. The faithful city. And what you see here, if you got your Bibles open, in verse 26, uh, is the city which once was faithful, who, who became that prostitute, that whore running after other gods, will again become faithful. But only, notice, it, when it passes through the fire of God's judgment, and only after God himself steps in and purifies his people, will that tension be relieved. Why? We got a clue. Verse 24. Isaiah uses three descriptions of three titles stacked upon each other to declare the glory of God and who God is. It's, it's a way to emphasize that God is able, now listen, God is able to do what God said he would do. He is what? The Lord. Now, your Bible, I, I'm, I'm assuming most of them, I don't know. Verse 24, the Lord, lower, uh, uppercase L, lowercase O-R-D. When you see that in Scripture, that is a translation of a word for Adonai, okay? Uppercase L, lowercase O-R-D. Adonai, master, superior, authority, royal jurisdiction. He's the master, the Lord, the Adonai. He's also Lord of hosts, capital L-O-R-D. That's a translation of the Hebrew word for Yahweh. The covenant name of God, the sovereign, omnipotent God, Lord of hosts, control over all creation, who is unquestionably able to, to, to affect his decrees, his will will be done. And yet he's also the mighty one of Israel. You notice that? The one who will display irresistible power the one who defends his people, the Holy One, the Mighty One of Israel. And up to this point, many times when God declares that, what's happening is he is, he is leashing this power and authority and his sovereignty. He's commissioned that and he has set forth that and he has shown that as a way to show his power against the enemies of Israel, but not here. God is acting against those within the covenant community who are abusing their positions of authority. They're defying the, the standards and obligations of their king that he requires. And he wills, look what it says, to satisfy his holiness. I will, verse 24. I will, verse 25. I will, verse 26. Notice that? Verse 24, I will get relief from my enemies and avenge myself on my foes. God is saying, look, I'm, I'm a God of justice. 
I'm a just God, a righteous God, and when my creatures whom I've created rebel against me and my holiness, it's offensive. Something must be done. But we are unable to do anything about it. That's the beginning of the gospel. That's the beginning of the gospel. The removal by God himself of the offense against the holy God. Uh, the satisfaction of his justice and his holiness. A divine, uh, the divine justice against his enemies must take place. That's the beginning of the gospel. Therefore, verse 25, I will, you see that? My hand will be against you. I will smelt away your dross as with lye and remove all your alloys. I will restore your judges at first. I will restore the city of righteousness, the faithful city. I mean, you would expect in verse 24 that God is laying out who he is and what he's done, getting relief from his enemies. You would expect verse 25 to be the hammer of justice and judgment on sinners, but it doesn't. Because he's full of grace and love and mercy. This future means of purification that will reverse the process of deterioration from verse 22. It's not fully explained. It says he will do it. But this purification and this transformation process will be completed. God will do it. And this work of grace, it says in verse 26 will end with having a faithful city, a city of righteousness by the Adonai, the master, who has, listen, cleansing, all-powerful, almighty, perfect cleansing power. That's what he means, smelt away your dross, metaphorically. Uh, I'll smelt away your dross. I I, I will get away, I will, will dissolve the garbage. Your imperfections with lye, lye is a strong chemical, exposes the metal. God is able to wash, God is able to clean every single sin stain away from his creatures. God is not only able to purify his church and cleanse his church, God promises to do so. He is able to remove the sin stain of the deepest Wicked and rebellion that you have ever done, that I have ever done. But he is also able to wash and remove the sin stain of the deepest wicked and rebellion that has been done to you. Let's not forget that. Some of us have been hurt deeply and our souls feel the need for cleansing. God is able, God is willing. This day that Isaiah is talking about, the restoration, has a present truth to it, but also a future certainty. For we know even now that the, that, 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 uh, that the church has people in it that have been bought with the precious blood of Christ, washed in the blood of Christ, and we're being constantly cleansed in the sanctifying process, but a day will come when God will transform the world. He'll remove all sin. He'll replace evil leaders and evil kingdoms and replace it with righteousness and justice. Passage is a reminder to leaders as well, right? We'll be accountable for how we lead God's people. But the whole point is that God who makes a promise keeps his promise. He will uphold his justice. He will establish his eternal kingdom. He will will keep the promise he made first really to Adam, then to Abraham, then to David. At the same time, as he upholds his justice, he'll be merciful to rebellious people. And purify them, refining them. In order so that we may enter in. It's a drastic process of refining, but God can do it. Notice back in chapter 1, verse 22, the leaders have been compared to the dross that was left when silver was refined. Now we find God stepping into the scene, and he's the silversmith, right? He's bringing the purification. John Mackey in his commentary says this. The furnace of his judgment will burn up the impurities that are present. And if intense heat is insufficient to affect the desired result, he will add parash, which is the Hebrew word for lie, an alkaline compound as a a flux to accelerate the processing 
the purifying process. Nothing will be spared in cleansing the land of iniquity, end quote. Hmm. Hebrews says the Lord disciplines those he loves. And the process cannot be done by man, but by God alone. If sinners are to be saved and washed and cleansed and purged, it must be God who does it. Now, before we move to the third point here, I just want to point out something to you, which I thought was very cool. Verse 25 and verse 26. They both start with the word turn. I will turn. Verse 26, I will restore. Same Hebrew verb, to turn or to bring back. And many times when you see, I will turn my hand, many times in Scripture, it speaks of, of a hostile action, actually. My hand will strike Egypt, Exodus 3. And we see this, not only discipline, this hostile, this kind of anger and wrath by God's hand. But here, praise God, although his hand will bring discipline, look what it says. It will also, his hand will bring purification, we talked about that, but also restoration, Restoration, the, the disciplinary and restorative acts of God are bound together. The discipline of God does what it, 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 it tends to do. It, it'll both purify and restore. And I thought, how, how, how awesome and beautiful and promising and encouraging that truth is when we're going through deep, dark times in our life, when God is pruning us, that is not only purifying us, but we have the absolute assurance that God is doing a work of restoration. The city shall be called again the city of righteousness. Faithful city. Just like when God's grace was upon King David, remember when we studied it in Second Samuel, first Second Samuel. At the beginning of his kingly reign, he made Jerusalem the city of God, the capital, the United Kingdom. Together, worshiping in Jerusalem. But according to 2 Samuel 8, 15, it says David, King David, administered justice and righteousness to all his people. After refining process, God is determined that his people will come back to the full covenant promise and reestablish a equitable, uh, equitable government. I will restore judges at first Back in the day, and the counselors, counselors were, were, were those, judges were those who administered the affairs of the nations, counselors gave advice, influenced the people, and Isaiah is looking around and he sees the rebellion of, nation, uh, of the nation of Judah and looks forward to the promise when the offspring of David, the king himself, Jesus will return and bring the fulfillment to completion, the cleansing of sin, the restoration of God's people. Now, we're going to talk, not today, but we're going to talk about the difference between an amillennial and a premillennial approach to the eschatology, the end times, um, because it depends on what you stand on that. Uh, some of these scriptures will matter, and, and this is one of them. Um, some people say, well, this is during the millennial reign, the thousand-year reign of Christ, literal. Some say, no. It's a, so we'll get into that. But let me just say this for now. Whether you're an amill or a premill, the final, the final and fundamental meaning of this passage and this prophecy is the time will come when King David's son, the Lord Jesus Christ, with true righteousness and true justice, perfect righteousness and perfect justice will be eternally established in his kingdom, which will last forever, ever, ever. Revelation 11. When the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdom, singular, when the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Perfect righteousness and perfect justice. The present lamentation, the process of purification, finally the promise of redemption. As we look at chapter 1, we see the beginning last week, this indictment, a call of repentance and cleansing. And now the outcome is the work of redemption. Verse 27, Zion, Jerusalem shall be redeemed by justice, and those in her who repent by righteousness. But, verse 26, parallelism here, the contrast, rebels and sinners shall be broken together, and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. And these final verses in chapter 1 draws the attention to the, to, to the audience, and for us even this morning, to the point of decisions that need to be made. And they have, a, you know, an eternal consequences. You can either enjoy the wonderful provision of the cleansing and redemption of God or suffer the disgrace and deterioration and destruction 
from God. Away from him, verse 28 through 31. Redemption is one word. Uh, it's, a, it's a strong word. It's used often to describe the gospel in the Bible. Redemption. Here at King's Chapel, we have three core values, EIC. Eternity, identity, community. Eternity, gospel redemption. Identity, gospel transformation. Community, gospel restoration. So for us, the big E on the I chart is eternity gospel redemption. It drives everything we do. That there is one eternal, all-powerful God, just as he's here in Isaiah 1. He's sovereign, he's glorious, and he's holy. And he created us in his imago Dei, in the image and likeness of God, with value, worth. For his own glory, he created us, and he provided for us. And just as he did the Old Testament saints... And bringing them out of Egypt, giving them his, his law. And we, like them, when we are called to a cosmic courtroom to give an account of our lives, we will hear the charge, we will see the indictment, we will be announced to the witness, and we will be found guilty of sin. All of us. Rebellion against our Creator. And sin is not only just breaking the commands of God, like lying and gossip and stealing, but like Judah... In our text, we're guilty of violating the very first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Spiritual whoredom. We bow down and we worship things and other things. We say, I must have this. And if we must have something, that becomes our lover. Romans 1, 25, we exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator God who is blessed forever. Amen. Whatever is in the place of God in our lives is now that which is our God and Savior. Sin is not just simply refusing to obey. It's, it's settling the heart on something besides God. Looking to something to save you. Looking to something to justify your existence other than the gospel. And everyone's trying to build that. Everyone's looking for a self. Everyone's looking for a worth, a, a self-esteem, uh, whether it's power, whether it's career, whether it's someone's love, whether it's a family, kids, looks, causes we're involved in, looking to something to say, I have meaning, I am somebody. That becomes your functional savior. And when we don't get it, or when someone takes it from us, we, are, we, we just disintegrate. We're losing a self. We're losing ourselves because we have identified and I base ourselves on it. And God could have said, look, you're chasing after idols. Chase after your idols. You're going to be disheartened. You're never going to find what you're looking for. You're never going to satisfy that dislocated heart. But he didn't leave us in our idolatry. He, he stepped into time in the person of Jesus. He's a compassionate, a redeeming God. It was God the Father who sent God the Son to rescue us and save us from our idols as Jesus became our sin-bearing substitute. To take away our sin and take the wrath of the Father upon himself to redeem us back from sin, Satan, death, and hell. And it's a gift of grace. Zion shall be redeemed by justice and for those who repent with her by righteousness. Righteousness and justice, the foundation, Psalm tells us, of God's throne, characterizes all that God does. Now the difference is God's justice is his decisions. It is his cosmic judgment, justice. His righteousness, his, his blamelessness, his, his rule of standard. God's seen here as the vindicator and salvation, as the redeemer, as the, our only hope for redemption. No one in Judah, and I'm hoping no one today, but no one in Judah would hear this indictment Found guilty by his justice, by his justice, our unrighteousness, and then would think, you know what, I could redeem myself. I hope not. That's the point. God is providing. But the, 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 there's, there, there's still a choice to be made. Verse 28 is a contrast. Unrepented people, repented people, uh, unrepented people who chase after idols, things of wood in those days. But rebels, verse 28, and sinners shall be broken together. And those who forsake the Lord, that's just like verse 4, who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. How? For they're, they'll be ashamed of the oaks that you desired, and you shall blush for the gardens that you have become. Now, understand what that means. 
Isaiah has already told them about false worship, that their hearts weren't in. They would go to the temple, they would do their sacrifices, but their hearts weren't in. And what the Israelites were doing is they were going to the temple, they were worshiping, and then they were going out and worshiping false gods in places with trees and gardens was very popular in those days to worship false gods, the god of fertility, the god of the earth, mother earth, all those things, the fertility god of Baal. And that's where their sanctuaries were. And, and Isaiah is using this imagery and saying, that's what you are. That, that, that's what is, is happening to you. You're chasing after false idols. You'll be ashamed, he says. You see the oak tree conjuring up a, a, this, this whole strong idolatry worship. For you, he says, shall be like that oak whose leaf withers and like a garden without water. In other words, Isaiah is saying, you have your idolatry, you're chasing after these things, but you know what? They're never going to sustain you. The leaves will wither. Their garden will be without water. I mean, what kind of garden you have without water, right? And leaves that are dying. You, you, will, you will not have what you're seeking after. Those who trust the light in the gods, will, in those gods will be disgraced and have shame. They will blush. And then verse 31, the strong shall become tender. Work a spark, and burn together. None will quench them. Putting your trust in other things won't be quenched. And although God imposes his judgment on those who rebel, he redeems the repentant. Do you notice that? Those who turn from their path of rebellion and, and pursue God and humbly submit to God, he redeems. God, God redeems us not, not simply by, by just sweeping our sin under the rug uh, or uh, neglecting his judgment or neglecting somehow his righteousness. No. He would cease to be God. So how does God redeem and, and restore? He comes and he pray, pays the price that is demanded by his own justice, that is demanded by his own righteousness. That's the gospel. That is the greatness of the accomplishment of the cross of Christ. Redemption comes not by God overlooking sin and rebellion or by ignoring his justice, but by his justice and righteousness being fully satisfied in the Lord Jesus Christ. Titus chapter 2, that our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Isn't that what we're saying? We're redeemed at a cost to God that we'll never, we'll, we'll never understand it completely, but we ought to acknowledge it, embrace it, and we ought to grow in the reality of the gospel. At the cross, God takes our sin. Our sin, our real moral guilt of sinners, and he places it on this perfect substitute. In the cleansing fountains of Christ, redeeming blood alone, our filth, our sin, our wickedness can be cleansed. In Christ alone, through his righteous life, we are made righteous in his sight. Through his death on the cross, the repentant sinner can be redeemed with justice. Our part, Isaiah tells us, you see the text here, our part is to repent. See that verse 27. Those who repent by righteousness. This is not adding to the work of Christ. Someone say, oh, you're adding to the work of Christ by faith alone. No, no. We're not adding to the value of Christ's sacrifice, but his love and his sacrifice claims all that we are. Now listen, family. Repentance is not a work. Repentance is not a work. It is the correct and right response to sinful and rebellious behavior. It's a response. When someone sins against you deeply, and that person comes and confesses and repents, and, and which means turns from their sins, change direction from their sinful behavior, and you say, I forgive you, they didn't earn it. They didn't work for that forgiveness. It's a matter of grace and grace alone. By their repentance does not now put you in debt as somehow they earned it. No, it's grace. And repentance and faith is one coin, two sides, and a way in which we respond to the gospel. It is the correct 
Repentance is the correct and right response to sinful and rebellious behavior. Paul told the church in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 1, that they become examples to believers all over Macedonia and Archaea. Not only because the word of God was being proclaimed from Thessalonica, but because they had their faith in God and how they turned to God from idols. See that? They had idolatry, worshiping false idols, and they turned from serving idols to serve the living and true God. To believe in Jesus, to trust in Jesus means we recognize that one is a sinner in rebellion against God. And we don't just add Jesus. We turn our life over to him. We change our mind about our sin. We change our mind about our need for a Savior. We change our mind about who's Lord and who's Savior and who is and who is not. One of the things that drew me to pastoral ministry, and one of the things, i got to be honest, that sustains me in pastoral ministry, is this work of redemption that God is doing the redemption and restoration in the lives of God's people. I mean, look out in this room. Maybe you're at home. <laughs> and we see so many situations where the love and the grace and the mercy and redemption of God steps in with broken lives, rebellious lives, hurting lives, major, uh, marginalized men and women, and washes them and redeems them and restores them through the gospel. Watching God work restoration and redemption and cleansing through the person and work of Jesus. Redemption is beautiful. God is glorious. As the band comes up, I want to share with you one last thing as we talk about redemption. There's one thing that every story in this room, every story in all creation can say about redemption. There's one common thread. There is one truth in every story, is that it, redemption is initiated and completed by the love of God and the grace of God. He alone is the hero. In 1987, there was an 18-month-old baby girl, Jessica. She fell. She fell 22 feet into a Texas well. Rescuers labored nonstop 55 hours her, 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 she was, she was, her, her life was hanging in the balance until they finally, 55 hours, reached down and extracted her from the well. And everybody and, and everyone who was watching all over the world breathed a sigh of relief and just gave praises and cheered the heroes of that story. What you don't find any headlines anywhere is that baby Jessica crawled up with her 18-month-old body and climbed up the wall and made it scratching and kicking all the way up. You don't read that. She was helpless and she was hopeless without rescuers. She could do nothing to deliver herself from that fate. Her hands, her, her fate was in the hands of the rescuers. And left to herself, she would perish. Family, likewise, when it comes to our redemption and cleansing, we're powerless. At just the right time, Roman tells us, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. We get no more applause of our own redemption than Jessica did. For God alone deserves ovation. In the story of redemption, God is the hero. It didn't just cost him 55 hours of labor. It cost him his own son who gave his life for our sins so that you can be redeemed. Every true story of redemption, God has the hero. Don't go away following verses 28 and following as rebels. Go away trusting in Christ, resting in him. Believers, we all need to have a life of repentance. Believers are marked, those who are growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ, are marked by repentance and faith, trusting in Christ. Maybe you never trusted Christ today. Today's the day. Today's the day I have been rebellious and I'm going to trust Christ for his cleansing power that he wrought at the cross of Jesus Christ. Let, let's respond by acknowledging Christ, our Savior, who went to the cross, who died for our sins, who rose from the dead, and let's worship him for all that he has accomplished. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for what you're doing in your people, Lord. And we pray that we would be people marked of faith and repentance, trusting, loving, worshiping you, and help us, Lord, to tear down the idols of our lives so that we can trust in you and you alone, we pray in Jesus' good name.